point six high. Oh, okay. The uh, the tides app that I have on my phone said we were supposed to have a six point six uh, tide. Okay, so that was, that was normal. So we got about two feet more because of the surge. That's about right. Yeah. So for reference. I've, I've probably got the same tides app as you. And the projected tide is only 5.4 this evening. So maybe 7.4 could be reasonable if, it, if the wind's still blowing, that, that could happen, which is still high. So we're all set, Jerry. Okay, so we have, um, I see Stephen from CSC. Oh, I see Patrick too. So welcome you guys, thank you. Um, just let me say that I had so hoped we were gonna do this in person because sometimes when you especially need a Q&A session, that's so much easier. So we had this COVID scare and full disclosure, part of the problem is we have several staff members down at Hilton Head at some meetings and seminars. And so we don't, everybody was exposed and then we don't have people to run the equipment. So just abundance of caution. And I think Kat, Catherine was right to, to go back to Zoom. But the silver lining is you don't have to be out in the storm and driving these flooded roads right now. So, <laughs> We had workmen this morning and they were very anxious to get back off the island. So anyway, um, we just have, before we get to, to CSA and Stephen Hirsch is on with us from SAPOA today, uh, we just have to do our quick bookkeeping stuff for FOIA. And so the first thing is we just need to approve the minutes from September 8th. So, so if moved. I could have a motion. Yes, so moved. Second. Second. Is there any discussion, comments, changes to those minutes you guys would suggest? No. If not, all in favor of approving those minutes, please say aye. 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 And aye for me. So I think that is unanimous. Patty's not going to join us today um, for um, various reasons. And so anyway, um, Catherine, are, are you kind of jotting down notes for the minutes or do you want me to? I'm actually taking the minutes as the meeting is going on. Perfect. So the agenda I put out had old business next for the committee to kind of talk about the work we've done or more appropriately not got done and talk about how to move forward. I'm going to move that to the end since we have guests here and I think the most important thing is to have our discussion with them. And so I'm going to kind of switch the order of the agenda and do um, um, move on to that discussion. So one of the reasons I don't think that we've moved really forward on rewriting the beach ordinance, it's easy to do this stuff about you know, the dogs and the fishing and, and grounding the boats. And, you know, we talked about nudity and drones and parasailing and all those things. That part's easy. The harder part's when you get up by the dunes and the definition there and how we should define it, how we should regulate or restrict access or what we need to do to truly protect our beach and, and those frontal dunes. So, and I'm not picking on fires on the beach, but that was what prompted me most to read definitions from up and down the coast in our sister communities. And they're so different than how we define the beach. And so I thought maybe the best thing to do was have our CSC guys talk and Steve Hirsch talk. Um, there's, there's a degree of definition in our comprehensive beach management plan. And if you guys haven't had a chance to look at it, um, it's pretty informative if you start on page 44 and right through there, it talks about the federal and state agencies that have jurisdiction, but then there's some good discussion about um, beachfront development regulation and the beach trust property. So um, 
I'm going to let Stephen, Stephen and Patrick introduce himself. I think we all know uh, Steve Hirsch from Sapoa, but my issue is I understand about how it got deeded to Sapoa and their responsibility, but under state law, what can the town do and what shouldn't we do or what should we do? So we're kind of looking for help in definitions and your recommendations. So anyway, Steve and Patrick, I will let you guys kind of take it away if you kind of have um, some comments on that. Hey, thanks. Uh, I guess I'll start and then uh, let Patrick introduce himself, but I'm Stephen Trainum. Um, I was been here with CSE since 2007 and did most of the project management for the last inlet relocation um, in 2015. Uh, so I'm um, taught the state a lot. We actually, I'm currently involved in this uh, task force or it's not quite a blue ribbon committee, but it's a, um, a committee of uh, several different stakeholders that are going through some of the uh, policies right now. And this question actually came up at our last meeting on definition of what is the beach dune system? Where does the state have jurisdiction? Uh, because their regulations don't quite match up with um, what happens in the real world sometime and it's left them some issues. So kind of a timely discussion. Um, so I'll get to that in a second. I'll let Patrick uh, introduce himself. Yeah, thanks, Stephen. Uh, my name is Patrick Barino. I've been with Coastal Science for five or six years now. Um, showed up right after the most recent Captain Sam's Inlet relocation in 2015, and I've been working on the annual beach monitoring reports ever since then. I also helped the town uh, rewrite its beach management plan back in 2019, early part of 2020, I believe, as well. Um, so I've been quite familiar with the goings on in terms of volume changes up and down the beach, different portions of the beach and how things have looked um, in, in situ over the past few years. Um, well, I, I guess I'll start with kind of talking about what the state does uh, with their jurisdiction and the, the talks that we've had. The state um, and their the statute identifies two um, kind of separate areas that they have jurisdiction over. Uh, one is the beach dune system. Um, and that is reference to the setback line, which is um, updated every 10 years. And I'm sure you're familiar with that. Um, but the basically wherever that setback line, anything seaward of that setback line is what they consider the beach dune system. Um, the issue that they've had recently is sometimes when the beach erodes after that line is set, you actually have areas that are active beach that are landward of that setback line. Um, and that falls under their beaches juris jurisdiction. Uh, so beaches is defined as that area that's devoid of vegetation, um, where it's kind of regularly uh, impacted by tides. Um, so anything kind of seaward of that um, first stable line of vegetation is what they call beaches. Uh, and their main issue is that they have a, a very um, clear set of regulations to manage the beach dune system, which is again, see rid of that setback line, uh, but they don't actually have a defined set of regulations for managing beaches. So when that, uh, when the instance occurs where that beach area is laying with the setback line, they don't have a clear set of policies that they can um, make decisions based off of. So that's something that they're trying to work on is how to, to fix that to allow um, the state jurisdiction in those areas. And some of the issues they've had are, um, you know, there's a state regulation against new seawalls, but homeowners, uh, right now can install seawalls landward of their setback line uh, if they have enough room to do that. So there's kind of a, a loophole that allows people to build seawalls um, in the in what somebody would normally consider a beach dune system um, if it's landward of that setback line. Uh, so for your purposes, um, it, it gets a little... Um, I call it's more of a political problem or legal problem um, with what towns may be able to regulate. Um, so, for instance, like alcohol on the beach and, and things like that, you're 
you can set local ordinances that apply to uh, the beach. It's like you're obviously aware of. So I, I guess your main question is how, um, where, landward of what, you know, is obviously the beach system, you know, right, Seabird of the Dune, Sandy areas. How far back can you go with those regulations? Is that the kind of the, the focus of the question here? That's like generally speaking, yes. Like, you know, a private property that abuts what we would consider the beach and actually a part of our beach, those property lines extend down into the beach. But then we have the, you know, the beach trust property there that suppose the trustee for. And so I guess that abuts our beach system or and I don't know, Steve Hirsch might be able to answer this. You know, the, our whole comprehensive plan talks about how the town and SAPOA manage the beach cooperatively. And I don't know if there's really legal documents that define that beyond the deed of the beach trust, or if we just have always got along and done it. But in trying to rewrite some regulations, I'm unclear of, do we go above that high tide mark? Or do we just talk about the ebb and flow of the tide? And, you know, it's constantly changing because right now we have lots of areas on the beach that are high tide. There's no, there's no beach on high tide there. So it, it's just, it's really even hard for me to pose the question because I don't quite, you know, above that high tide mark, what can we regulate? Is it the state or is it supposed D to the beach trust or... That's where I hope you guys could kind of give us some direction. Can, can I jump in on that for one second? Yeah, Joe, of course. We have the authority to regulate everything in our town limit. Well, not everything, but most things that we would consider, you know, offensive in the beach and dune areas. It doesn't really matter necessarily who owns that property. So, you know, for example, we can say all dogs in the town limits have to be on a leash. Um, that's something we could do on private property, on public property, on beach trust property. Um, so from that, from that perspective, it's really not a question of, of jurisdiction because you, you can adopt ordinances that restrict certain activities. I, I think the key is, um, you know, if we're talking about something specific to the beach, then our ordinance should be clear and consistent as to what we mean by the beach. Is it the high water mark? Is it the state statutory definition where there's no non littoral uh, vegetation? Is it the jurisdiction line? Is it the setback line? How do we deal with it when it's on somebody's private property? Um, <clears throat> but I, I, the, the bigger question is we, we can regulate pretty much any sort of activity. The, the bigger question is how we define where certain regulations will take place. And as always, Joe does a better job of putting my questions into like an explanation and a question to you guys. Um, Those are good points. And, and Jerry, you made a good point. The, the, the language of who manages what between Sapo and the town is vague, but I think the reason for that is because of the nature of that boundary that it's always changing. This is a very dynamic shoreline. You know, the high tide line today is different than the high tide line tomorrow. I, I think it was probably written with some, uh, you know, room for interpretation intentionally because of that vagueness. And, and again, I'm not picking on the issue of fires on the beach, but that's where it becomes so evident of, like Joe said, we, I guess the umbrella is we could, and I, as I look up and down, you know, the coast at the regulations, we could just say no outdoor, outdoor burning. And I guess that would catch that, you know, above the high tide mark where supposedly allows those fires. So, that's just where it became most evident of how to define the beach and what goes on there. Um, do we go above that high tide watermark 
and somehow include the dunes? And can we legally do that under state law and definitions? And, you know, if the that setback lane is on private property or if it's not on private property and it's in the beach trust. So that I was hoping CSC could kind of help us on that. Yeah, so I, I don't think we can provide uh, the definitive, or we certainly can't provide kind of a legal um, analysis of what you can and can't do under your ordinance. Um, we can help with, you know, from the engineering perspective, what do we, you know, what do we generally consider the beach dune system, um, which would include, you know, all the sandy areas. It would, it would generally include at, at minimum the entire primary dune. You know, which would be your, you know, your kind of tallest um, ocean front or most seaward um, full dune, not just a you know, freshly kind of growing dune. So Stephen, uh, does the primary dune have to have vegetation on it or is that the first level of oh, like maritime forest, which up by Camp St. Christopher, or is it just- no, it, Yeah, it wouldn't be maritime forest. Um, the, the dune certainly would be vegetated. It would have sea oats um, and that type of, uh, you know, your normal uh, kind of first level of the succession vegetation. Um, the state has a definition for the primary dune that's, you know, three feet tall and extends for 500 feet, um, generally continuous. Um, that's a pretty effective, you know, first cut at a primary dune from a from their purposes of trying to define a line. Um, engineering wise, it's a little more messy than that. We'd like to see a little bit bigger dune. Um, that's kind of the, what the primary dune may be. Um, if just from kind of my thoughts on if if you're trying to claim, or not claim jurisdiction is the wrong word here, but if you're trying to manage that area, I don't think there are very many activities that you would allow in, we'll call it the dune field area that you wouldn't allow on the beach. You know, if you don't want somebody burning on the beach, you don't want somebody burning in the dune area. Um, things like that, where it's people's actions and activities. Um, let me, can I, let me ask one question. If your intent is to write an ordinance that applies to the beach area, and as Joe has stated, the town does have authority to do that. Could, and you wanted a boundary that you're trying to reference, could you not reference the Osirium setback line as that boundary that would be, uh, include the beach dune system? I'm, I, Joe and I have talked about that and I think we could, but you know, how does that work? Doesn't that setback line change every few years? It, it does, and that was actually kind of where I was going with this, is your setback line, since you are in a um, inlet, area, uh, your setback line is um, set by or the baseline, which is the first step in it, is defined by where the, the beach was um, the most landward position over the last 40 years. Uh, so generally speaking, that's along where the old seawall was along the North Beach area, uh, which include, so any all that vit accreted area seaward of that old seawall would be part of the beach dune system according to the state. And along Camp St. Christopher and the inland shoreline there, it's, it's actually pretty far back into the dune field there. Um, so that really does cover the majority of your dune area. Um, and along the seawall that's exposed, it, it falls kind of right along the crest of the seawall. Um, so that I, I think it's a kind of a logical starting point for, for the discussion because it, it, to me at your beach specifically, it covers pretty much everything that, from the engineering side, we would call a beach dune system you know, in addition to the political side. Uh, the complexity with that is it's not something, you know, if you're a, a visitor, a resident, a code enforcement officer, beach patrol, whatever, that line is not necessarily something that's going to be readily apparent. Um, whereas if you're using, you know, the absence or presence of vegetation, that's something that you can look at and, you know, either there's vegetation there or there's not. Uh, whereas if we're using, you know, some line that's drawn somewhere on a map, 
that's a lot harder to enforce because, you know, people are in all likelihood not going to know where that line is. And that's one of the complexities too. That's a good point, but I, it's always going to be behind the dunes, roughly 20 feet behind the dunes. So, so it would include all of that area you were looking to enforce, yeah. I would imagine. Yeah, you know, I was going to say, um, Joe, I think, you know, you're, you're right that there are some areas where there is a portion of what could be considered, you know, on the ground as part of the beach dune system that would be Lambert of that setback line. But in that case, couldn't you just include some language that says, you know, within the within the, the beach dune system as defined by the state, as well as any adjacent vegetated surface, you know, something like that, because the, the only area I'm, I'm looking at the setback line map right now on my screen and the only area where you have, you know, a, a, a location landward of that line where someone could conceivably, you know, want to have a fire or something like that is way up on the Western end of the island. Um, and it's pretty heavily vegetated uh, with a mixture of what looks like shrub and pretty dense grass. Um, well, I, I was looking more so from the other direction where you have lines that not necessarily where the beach is landward of the line, but where, um, you know, the line is sitting in the middle of somebody's backyard or in the middle of uh, the, you know, the, the beach club or something like that, where, you know, if we went that far landward with our definition, now we're potentially impacting, you know, if we classify it as beach, it could be, you know, somebody's backyard or, you know, private property that's really not beach per se. I mean, I understand the logic of using the setback, but isn't there the definition of what the baseline is and that's more seaward? Is that, would that work at all Com versus Joe's concern with the setback? I mean, how, what's the, what, how do we see the difference between baseline and setback on our beach? Yeah, the the um, the baseline is what's set first, and it's defined by that position of the most landward shoreline over the last forty years. And I think everywhere along um, Seabrook, the setback line is just twenty feet um, landward of that. Uh, okay, that's correct. Um, yeah, and, and it doesn't, they don't cut across anyone's private property. Um, it, it follows the position of the buried revetment. Um, and so even in areas where you have private property that goes right up to that buried revetment, um, the, the functional end of the private property and where it begins to be accreted land is, is the approximate location of the setback line. Because we have a few properties down by the beach club where when you look at their property lines on the map, they actually extend well into the beach where there's yeah. wet sand. Yeah, and that's probably one of those legal questions where you'd have to go back to the actual deed and see if it's deeded to the mean high water or a particular location um, or a distance you know, from a, a different reference point. Um, there also is some discussion um, about whether a lands accreted revert back to a property owner if they accrete naturally or if they um, become kind of part of the state trust. Um, there's an attorney general's opinion that, um, from a couple of years ago uh, discussing that, basically saying um, that it, as of 1977, lands that accrete naturally um, should be part of the state trust. So again, that, that's something that could be argued from a, a lot of people who are better, better lawyers than I can pretend to be. <laughs> and you said that dates back to 77? Yes, I can, uh, okay. I can see that. It was, it uh, originated from an issue over at Polly's Island where the spit was growing um, to the south. And so as that spit grew, the question was, well, does the, the um, ownership, does that lot keep growing or does it, you know, is that state property there? So uh, that's just an opinion. It's not an actual case that's been decided. Um, so it may not be, you know, 
fully in effect or anything, but it's. Um, I saw that Mark had his hand up. Mark Andrews. Mark, do you have a question? Yes. Um, when you use uh, a line that, or it, the vegetation issue is interesting because as you move toward the inlet, a lot of the area uh, that we have now around the, the lagoon or the um, has it has vegetation around it right to the water line there at the lagoon and a lot of the very small um accumulations of sand have vegetation on it as well so i think that hearing the definition that it includes some longer um extension of that dune helps to uh, define things a little better than just the vegetation. It needs to, I think the definition might need to have two parts if it's going to be uh, a visual sort of definition. That's all. I mean, that's a good point. Like, how would we include the, is the lagoon part of the beach? I mean, up there by the inlet, Stephen, yeah, do you see I, that part beach up there? I would think, um, again, kind of establishing that the beach dune system is includes all of those areas that are seaward of the baseline or setback line. Um, and then maybe tailoring specific activities to, you know, areas that are sandy areas or areas that are, you know, south of the oyster catcher access. Um, you know, you may have to kind of identify exactly what activities you're going to allow where but I, I think it may work in your best interest to have kind of establish it yes you are the beach dune system includes vegetated areas it includes the, the lagoons you're not just referring to the absolute dry sand areas because they you know those change way too often um now again certain ordinances may you know if you if you're allowing fires on the beach, you, you want to say that, yes, those will only be allowed on sandy areas, you know, 50 feet from vegetation or something like that. Um, but anytime when you start drawing these kind of jurisdictional lines, it just, every time you, you solve one problem, you tend to create another. Um, so it does get very difficult. Um, I I guess, too, one of the questions I had for you, not guessing, it is one of the questions. So relocating the inlet and everything always involves the protected habitat and all those issues with um, both federal and state agencies. So are we doing everything we should in our regulation now? Do you guys recommend you know, as, as part of that whole process and the permitting and leading up to it, are we doing what we need to do to make that process be possible and move forward and still protect wildlife and, you know, protected vegetation and everything? Do you guys have recommendations? I know it'll eventually come when we do the update to the beach management plan, but in the meantime, if we're rewriting the ordinance, are there things we should put in there? Um, uh, you know, going back to the 2015 project, really the, the big focus was dogs off, uh, dogs in that area in general, but especially dogs off leash. Um, I'm not sure if that's still the ordinance that we, we still have that zone where no dogs are allowed. Um, so yeah. yeah. Once yeah. you go above boardwalk one towards the inlet, our curtain ordinance says no dogs at all. Yeah. That was really the biggest concern from both Fish and Wildlife Service and um, the coast conservation folks. Um, so I, I think that you know, kind of maintaining that and not trying to to back out of that is is probably you know, the biggest thing we can do. Um, with the next project, just getting out ahead of it enough time to work with these folks to 
to get a schedule that works for the the birds and the turtles and kind of being able to really pinpoint exactly when we want to do the the realignment um you know, there's the discussion of the sand transfers and we're working through that now, um, but doing that in a way that avoids the most sensitive areas um, while still trying to accomplish the goals uh, and get a dry beach everywhere. And again, that deals with, you know, the, the boundaries on where sand may be borrowed from and the timing of the project and that kind of thing. Um, and so... You know, that always raises a question with me because, again, you know, our management plan talks about the cooperative effort between SAPO and whose responsibility is what. And so, like, the sand transfer and everything is SAPOA's, and you guys are working with them, but all that really is beach area. Is that town jurisdiction? Is that just kind of precedence? And I'll go to Steve Hirsch with that, that that's kind of how it gets taken care of before the town gets involved at all? I think precedence is a good word. That's how it's been since I've been here. Um, no one's ever questioned why. I, I, it's just kind of the way it's always been, but that's a good point. Yeah, because I read through this and I really can't find like the legal direction of why it went that way. I mean, the town's happy you guys do it because you also pay for it. So, uh... well, I'll tell you why is because I think Sapoa predates the town, and the, okay. beach, and the beach needs were there when Sapoa was formed. So, there wasn't anybody else to do it. Yeah, I mean that's a really good point. And then, I think the original developer established the beach trust and then deeded it to Sapoa when correct went bankrupt or whatever. So. Correct. I think it was just, yeah, it, suppose it was here before the town. That would be my guess. Okay. So, I mean, back to our consultants from CSE, can you give us any recommendations or advice? Do you kind of said the logical was to use the setback line, so that's something we could debate, but, you know, other than that, I'm kind of still at the ah, stage of um, of rewriting our beach ordinance, or maybe it doesn't need to be that drastically changed. I mean, I personally think it does, but um, I'm, I'm really open to you guys giving us maybe some direction on it. Um, I, I'm trying to... To think, um, and again, I, I think it's probably a something where you need to look at. Are you are you trying to just have an overall? If you're if you're discussing just an overall management plan on, you know, the town is going to manage our beach, then I think you need to include the in basically where where the state has defined the beach dune system. Okay. Um, because that would include the inlet management area. Um, it includes all that accreted land that formed from that original uh, 1984 project, um, 1983 project. Um, and it, it will give you the flexibility to uh, manage that area as, as a plan. Now, again, for specific activities, maybe that's a little too broad, you know, but I, I don't think there are too many things you know, if you don't want a dog out on the sandy beach, you're not going to want a dog running through the, the dune area either. Um, so I, I'm trying to think of things that would not fall um, or that would fall outside of that. And maybe you have a caveat that, uh, you know, this is the beach student system with this ordinance. However, for properties that extend, you know, out to the seawall um, where it's exposed, you know, they have a variance from, you know, somebody wants a fire pit out in that area or something like that. Um, I, I think you could probably have some type of caveat for, you know, whether you call them out by address or, you know, the ones that are located along a sort, certain portion of the seawall um, so that you're not trying to prevent them from doing things in their backyards. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's, when you go out boardwalk five, trying to think walking out those boardwalks, 
So Steve, is that the one that was rebuilt five? Correct. It's the most recent rebuild. And so when you go out that boardwalk right now, that seems like the whitest spot on the beach and at high tide, there's always dry sand. Is that, a cre- is that an accreted area of the beach? Will that change when you do the movement of the sand? Well, it's always changing. Well, I so, you know, assuming so, that, yes, but. So yeah, you, you know, if you look at this thing on a longer time scale, uh, you know, the last inlet relocation in 2015, the dry sand beach at five was not nearly that wide. Right. Uh, but as that shoal that's offshore continues to send sand on the Seabrooks shore, uh, that area has grown. And in theory, that sand will continue to transport down the beach towards six, toward the club. And uh, that dry sand beach should transfer with it. How okay. fast, how fast, I think is, there's a lot of variables, storms, wind, mm-hmm. tides. Um, but that is the pattern we have observed through the series of inlet relocation projects we've completed. Okay. It's just one of those things I always have in mind because I don't want to write an ordinance that is so specific with a definition or something that in two years changes because the beach has, you know, shifted. So I think that's a good point. The only guarantee that is, is that it will continue to change. So kind of go more general and maybe that's the whole each June system with the setback line is a good way to go. So yeah. I'm uh, talking and talking. So somebody else jump in here, please. Yeah. It is five right there near Amberjack Court and Rincon Point. Yeah, yeah. That's, yeah, that's what I was going to say. That's kind of a permanent zone where the island does stick out a little bit. So it's not surprising that you have a nice wide dry sand beach right there. It's not going to go away with just one project. Yeah. Well, um, I was going to say just before the 20. 20- 15 project, that area was highly erosional. We had um, myrtles in the surf. I uh, had a lot of you know, vegetation being wiped out because the the sand supply had been cut off. So it, it, as Steve said, it, it's a highly dynamic area and um, they'll go through phases of five years gaining sand, five years eroding sand and I'll do the to the inlet. Oh, I just think even in the you know, looking back to the beginning of the summer, if you got that boardwalk where there was no vegetation, if you're out there now, there's like, you know, little sand dunes with tufts of vegetation on it that wasn't there six months ago. So someone showed me a series of pictures they had taken by the post, the boardwalk number post at five. And it was over a course of about three years and the sand had risen about five feet in that area. Okay. Based on the height of the post, I thought it was interesting. So, Martha, any questions or Dean? I'm still confused. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know about the rest of you. (laughs) Um, I mean, it does help if if you haven't read through the you know, the beach management plan. Um, every time I go through it, I pick up a little bit more information and it's something that's going to have to be updated and redone. But I mean, it is helpful, but like you said, then I still get confused when you try to put pen to paper and what is it we want to do in our ordinance. So I, I would it we, we keep talking about different lines. We talk about a baseline. We talk about high tide normal high tide lines. We talk about the setback line, which I presume is the, what is it, OCRM? It's the same thing, right? Yes. Okay. And it would be, I'm a visual kind of guy. It would be nice to see where these lines are. Uh, Am I allowed to share my screen? Oh, we would be thrilled if you shared your screen. I don't know. I don't know if Zoom gods will let you, but Dean, if you look in the chat, I just dropped a URL. That's the beachfront jurisdictional line viewer. You should be able to open up the website through there, but that's what Stephen's showing right now. Yeah, is that coming through? Yep. Yeah. Okay. So here is the the blue line is the setback line. The red line is the baseline. Um, the yellow line is just showing where a uh, unstabilized inlet zone is. It's 
uh, pretty much the entire island. Um, so right now, the state would define the beach dune system as anything seaward of this blue line. So this entire area would be the beach dune system. That blue line is 20 feet back from the red line? Is that what you're... Right. And the red line is set at the most landward beach position over the past 40 years, which is right along where the seawall was exposed back in the 80s. Um, so, so you, Jerry, Jerry, what are we trying to get at here? Are we trying to get at the town has complete jurisdiction from that red line on out? Period. I, I want Joe or, jump in here just so that when we write our ordinance and we, you know, even in the existing ordinance, we talk about not disturbing vegetation, you know, flora and fauna and vehicles up in there or dogs up in there or walking up in there and so that's how our current ordinance starts with these definitions. And, you know, like right now, it just starts with the definition of the high tide mark. Right. And that's not good. So that's what I'm trying to get at. And then from that point, we decide what we want to regulate or restrict. And as Joe says, in theory, we could, because of the umbrella of the town, we could do essentially... I guess what we want. Feel free to jump in here, Joe, because I feel like I'm babbling. So, so what I'm thinking is there's almost like four different levels or areas of regulation. So we'll start from the the largest. We have general townwide jurisdiction, general police power to regulate certain activities to you know protect public health safety things like that that's on the beach that's in the dunes that's in the middle of a neighborhood in the street um you know by and large that's a town-wide uh, authority um <clears throat> looking kind of as we move closer to the beach i think we could have one set of regulations that applied um <clears throat> You know, basically from the, um, you know, whether it's the critical line or the setback line out. And then I think we could have a separate set of regulations that apply in what the state defines a beach as, which is basically the absence of vegetation. And then basically from the high tide line out one mile, that's another authority that we have under state statute we can regulate out one mile from the high tide line so what i would say is we could have something like you know general rules which apply town-wide both on and off the beach and dune um, we could have certain regulations that apply only in the dune system area but not necessarily on the beach or they could apply in both <clears throat> we would have one set that would apply only on the sandy beach. And I think if you can pull that map back up um, and go to the club area, um, the beach club area, I don't know if you're able to pull that or not. Um, so an example of what something like that may look like is, <clears throat> you know, our, our current ordinance says you can't engage in commercial activities on the beach. Well, if we define the beach as everything from either that red or blue line out, if we zoom into the club, there's the pelican's nest. Well, that line is sitting right in the middle of the pelican's nest. And to say you can't engage in commercial activities if we use that to define the beach, that means you can't have the pelican's nest because that's a commercial activity. Um, so, you know, for something like that, we may go in and say, well, only on the sandy beach you can't have commercial activities and then when we get out to the you know the high water mark out one mile you know that's where we can regulate um you know dangerous boating and um you know beaching a vessel and things like that so it would be almost like breaking it out into a couple different zones where we would have different regulations within each zone and you can kind of custom tailor them to um, to each specific zone. So like, you know, Joe said about being, you know, maybe we would have things apply to both zones. 
like one of the things that happened this summer were like teenagers up around the lagoon and I don't know if they had those skim boards, but they were up in the dunes, but claimed they were on the beach. So our regulation was very ambiguous there for like beach patrol of what to say to, say to those teenagers. So that was something that needs cleaned up. So, you know, that was part of the whole definition problem for me anyway. I like the way that Joe kind of outlined that. We've got four separate regions that we need to have the rules for. Yeah. Uh, and there's going to, I would presume there are going to have to be listed some exceptions. And I don't know why you could not have a exception in there for the club and the pelican's nest or whatever that is. Uh, you're going to also have to have some exceptions in there from boardwalk one to the north and boardwalk nine, whichever direction that is west, um, for the dogs, uh, that kind of stuff. But I don't see it as being impossible to do. Okay. You know, I think based on what Joe was saying, too, around the beach club area, you've got that exposure of the revetment. You could always just include some qualifying language saying either the landward, the landward most, you know, either the setback line or the exposed rock. Pick right. One. Um, right. And that kind of sidesteps the issue of people doing stuff in their own yards or at the beach club. You know. But then as far as, you know, skim borders go, having the like, like Joe was saying, again, having something specifying tiers for the unvegetated beach versus the beach dune system versus the submerged beach, that might be an easy way to handle it all. Mm -hmm. I mean, because we want to make sure that, especially up by the inlet and up above Boardwalk 1, we keep all kinds of protections in for, I mean, turtles are kind of the whole beach, but turtles up there and then all our, our shore birds. Shore birds, yep. And the, the area that um, is around the lagoon um, is an amb ambiguous area. It's a transition zone between um, what you would ordinarily call dunes and until you add the word vegetation to the definition of dunes, then to me, it is not a dune system. And we allow driving, we allow fishing, we allow a lot of activity around that lagoon. And the lagoon now is completely vegetated to the water's edge. So I, I think that in defining uh, skimboard activities, then, you know, like you, a problem that you had last year, then we're going to have to write a regulation that says perhaps that skimboards are only allowed on uh, ocean beaches or whatever and not in in this other area. Um, there, there are a lot of, I think we're going to run into a lot of work in terms of defining that area around the uh, northern part of our beach. Well, the lagoon, and this is a question for, for our to consultants, um, will the lagoon disappear when the in, when the inlet has to be relocated? Yeah, by the time the um, inlet migrates or continues to migrate every year, it's going to eat into that lagoon eventually. Um, you know, if we did the project this year, then it would stay, um, but the kind of the the intent of the project is you allow the inlet to migrate kind of through the entire area where it used to exist, at least to the, to the point where we relocated it last time. So that lagoon would be um, lost over the next couple of years. What um, is the expectation or the estimate of when you'll have to, we will have to relocate again, the inlet? 2028 is what we're estimating at the moment. And so how far out, Steve, do you start the permitting process? About three years. years. Three years? It'll be here before we know it. 
It really <laughs> will. Yeah, and I'm I wouldn't be opposed to starting the process even earlier because permits are good for five years. So having it in hand and working through the process, um, you know, there's there's no harm if you think it's going, you know, if we had the permit next year, then we we've got any time between 2024 and 2029 probably to actually build the project. Um, kind of allows you some flexibility should there be a you know, major storm or some kind of, you know, natural event that changes things or not really worry about constructing, you know, contractor availability, but there's a lot of economics and things that could go along with that too. So who, makes that, who makes that decision to start? Town, Sapoa, the consultants? All of the above. <laughs> That's... That's the cooperative management that you gets referenced all the time in our beach plan. Well, but I, I like think that. it probably. I like, that. I it like probably, that idea of starting early. Yeah, it probably starts with Sapoa and Steve and, and Heather and the board initiating that they're ready to go forward with it. Okay. I mean, that's my understanding when I read how it's worked in the past and then. So uh, yeah, the, the the way it usually works is we monitor the condition of the beach on an annual basis, and there's some triggers. You know, basically the position of Captain Sam's Inlet tells us when it's time to start. If there are no more questions for Stephen and Patrick, um, and you guys don't want to sit through some more of this. <laughs> Feel free to, to sign off. Um, and many, many thanks for like sitting in. And if um, I always like after conversations, when you ponder things and comments, if there's anything you want to pass on later, please feel free to shoot us an email. Yeah, of course. Thanks for having us. Yeah, yeah hopefully we were helpful. Thank you. Oh, no, very helpful, because at least for me, that whole setback baseline thing makes a little more sense with your explanations and how do, we can do some do we have Do we have access to that uh, map that you guys shared with us? I've seen it before, and I don't know if it's in the back of this comprehensive report, but it might be. It okay. should be included in the 2019 comprehensive plan, okay. but also yeah. if you're able to open up the chat feature in this meeting, I, I put the link to it. So you can just click that. It should open up on your computer. Okay. okay. Yeah. There's lots of maps in the, in the, the comp, the management plan. And I think one of them in the back is that setback line. I, Cause I've seen it before and that may be where I've seen it. Yeah. You know, it's yeah, kind of like when you get into reading this, there's a, point where you're like yeah 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 another man. <laughs> and you flip too quick so anyway i'm pretty sure it's in there but we'll open the chat thing and uh um i know joe has it too because he's showed it to me as we've had these discussions so we will get it out for everybody to see somehow okay thank you anyway steve you're welcome to continue to sit in as we talk about this because but you don't have to i'm Mention of the storm. It is so dark and raining so hard out here right now. It's a good thing you went home. It's nasty. There's no doubt. Yeah. It's unbelievable. All right. Thank y'all. We'll see you Thank soon. You Thanks, y'all. We'll see you later. Thank you. All right. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Thanks Steve, Steve, very much. Oh, you know, Steve, before you leave. Yes. I have a quick question about armadillos because I keep, I keep getting questions or people emailing, like, is the town going to do anything about them? And I'm like, well, we kind of leave turkeys and deer to Sapoa. So I'm pretty sure that's where the armadillo issue should come down. Yeah, we're going to hire an armadillo hunter. He's going to go out and eradicate them from the island. <laughs> Is that like tongue in cheek? <laughs> Dean, Dean, Dean is the guy. Call Dean. He's the armadillo hunter. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Armadillo hunter. I, I think, uh, from what I can tell, is our position at least at this time was outlined in the September Seabrooker. 
Okay. Essentially, it's, uh, you know, if you've got some specific issues at its specific property, um, there are a couple of remedies in there, one of which is to hire somebody to come out and eradicate them. Um, and others, other alternatives are some type of uh, what do I want to call it spray or mothballs or something like that to get them to go from your property over to your neighbors. Um, I have had a problem under my HVAC stand front porch and the two decks and back probably leading to 10 holes that they've dug. I went ahead and filled them in and threw mothballs under there and haven't seen them since. How big are the holes they dig? Oh, a foot to 16 inches. And who knows how far the depth goes. Oh, okay. The, the, the problem is, is if they're after something that, uh, the, and they go under your foundation, you've got a problem. Okay. Uh, I've seen them going ours across the street and next door um, I've see the holes digging under uh, sidewalk wow yeah yeah well, we it, had them in some Sapoa buildings in the crawl space and um, we've had to have them removed and uh, yeah. we call a, a wildlife expert um, that's what I would recommend to residents uh, Sapoa uses critter control. They'll come out and set a trap and remove them. Already, but, thank you. Like I yeah. said, there there seems to be some type of chemical spray or, like I said, mothballs that are a kind of first step. I would think, unless you're seeing uh, critters in your in your crawl spaces. So. It's not environmentally sound, but I'm a mothball person because of snakes. So uh, maybe that's why we've had no armadillos because I have so many mothballs out for the snake. <laughs> and they only last about a month. You got to keep throwing them back out. Oh, yeah. Especially when it's raining like this, yeah. it kind of yeah. dissolves them. And then you're yeah. like out there again. Okay. Anything else? That's it for me. Thanks, Steve. Right. Take care, guys. Thanks, Steve. So you guys, I'll backtrack then to the agenda where I said old business and just general review. And part of that comes from my frustrations as the chair of this committee. And, you know, every time we have a council meeting, the mayor asks, you know, for a report from the committees. And I'm like, oh, well, we met again or we didn't meet again. <laughs> but, you know, we really haven't produced anything. And and then I look at like the community engagement com committees like had food trucks and planning the Christmas party and all this stuff. And I'm like, we're not productive. But then on the other hand, it's apples and oranges yeah. because I can't ask you guys to be actually writing ordinance language or, you know, any type of statutory language. So um, you know, that's part of it, that that's a time consuming thing. And um, Joe's going to be our go to person on that. And he legitimately so tied up with DSO stuff we had to get through and the budget and short term rentals is always hanging out there. And, um, and so just from a time wise, you know, I was kind of hoping in the fall, we'd have something to present to council and it just wasn't going to work. So I think we're into the first quarter of next year. Um, and in the meantime, I know a couple of you sat in on the marsh management plan that Folly um, mm -hmm. kind of came over and talked to us about. And we put money in the budget um, that if we want to proceed, if council decides to proceed with that, we have some consulting money in the budget. So anyway, I just kind of wanted to throw that out there that if you guys are frustrated, is this worth your time? Um, do you have ideas what we should be working on projects? Um, you know, do we do a beach cleanup or, or is there anything like that you want to do or 
I mean, for me, it's always helpful to get the feedback of what you guys are thinking, but I kind of wanted to get your feedback on how the committee should proceed, what we could get done, that kind of stuff. So jump in. I don't see your perceived lack of progress as, as being an issue or even correct. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that we've had to sort through as far as what we discussed today, where's the line, and all the little interest, intricacies that we do or do not allow on the beach. Um, it just takes time. Yeah, and I mean, I, and I know, and I know, we had some issues with being able to meet last spring, uh, so that delayed it a little bit. But you know, this is more than just sitting here saying, "Hey, let's have food trucks." Okay. <laughs> exactly. I, you know, when I when I get frustrated, like, oh my god, look at what this committee is getting done, and I'm like, like I said, apples and oranges, because yeah. we can't yeah. in one month or in a couple months you know, produce something like this. And I really do think we've talked through fishing and activities on the beach and I have tons of notes to work from. And um, so from that perspective, I think we've made progress, but I just hope that you guys feel like it's worth your time to sit in on these meetings. And if there are activities or something that you think the committee could sponsor and recommend to council. I mean, throw them out there. I mean, I think our beach most of the time is fairly clean when I'm out there. I don't know if putting tons of sea brookers out there, if we're going to produce very much. Well, the, the thing is there, whoops. There are tons of, I mean, every morning people are picking up trash. Well, so, and that's you know, true. That, you know, my big project when I first came on council were garbage cans because the turtle people said, we're out there every morning picking up garbage and then we don't have any place to put it. So, you know, the garbage cans. So certainly in the morning and there's all these people picking it up, I've just meant, is it worth having a, a community-wide beach cleanup day? I'm not sure what you would get. Uh, you yeah, know, maybe, I think they get maybe, out there and think, yeah. you I know, mean, you they, could maybe do a, I mean, I see more trash walking my dog on the side of the streets yeah. than necessarily on the beach, Yeah, yeah. you yeah. know, uh, but. I and mean, because, I mean, we're a public beach with private access, so I don't think we have some of the trash issues that Folly has, for instance. Right. And they do beach cleanup things. So, yeah, I kind of put that one aside. Um, I think that if we establish something to come up with a beach management plan that this committee, the mayor has already told me would be in the forefront and we'll dive into that. Um, I hope we have a beach ordinance before we start on that. So anyway, I just wanted to put that out there a bit of frustration on my part. And if you guys share that, I'll shut up at that point. <laughs> I'm hearing crickets. <laughs> Making progress, but it's slow. Yeah. yeah, I agree. I think that, you know, we've made a lot of progress. We've had these uh, month long interruptions, though. And I find it, it's its probably my age, but I, I find it difficult to remember what we did from one meeting to another <laughs> <laughs> and what was said. And, and oh, even minutes are, gotta have are notes. <laughs> well, yeah, I've got mine too, but, you know, um, I'm wondering if there's a different way that we could handle the process. I know that you want to keep the, the ordinance kind of under wraps, you know, be, for fear of, of leaks and that sort of thing. But I'm just wondering if there's if there's any other way to um, to work on that. The other idea would be to uh, uh, instead of all of us working on uh, the whole project, do we uh, are, is there are there pieces of this that would be 
could be farmed out so that uh, Martha has to research everything or just some of the stuff. <laughs> and, uh, you know, you know, are there are there ways to divvy up some of the work that we could, yeah. you know, just to look at our, our process? That That's what I'm, I'm thinking about. I, I don't have answers. I'm <laughs> just throwing out an idea. Well, I think, um, you know, we can, you know, definitely go back to drafting, especially the part of the ordinance. You know, if we kind of look at Joe's thing about, you know, four zones or four parts and drafting the part of the ordinance that really focuses in on a lot of our discussion about activities and things on the beach. Um, Joe and I write differently. I was kind of trained to U.S. code and he writes much better for South Carolina law and municipalities. But we can do, I can do another draft one um, that takes in effect all our notes and do it like we used to do on the Hill. Um, meet in person and everybody has a copy of that to look at, mark up and whatever. And you hand it back in before you walk out the door. And it's not then out there on emails to be circulated and have everybody freaking out over a word or a sentence or something. So, you know, I'd love to maybe do a couple of those in meeting, in-person meetings, because it's almost easier to do the back and forth and say, oh, but what if here we added this sentence or we just forget about this altogether or something. It is, so, yeah, and I, I'm, I still print things out on paper and it's much easier to look at it and to have everybody be able to talk about it with it in hand. Right. It's hard when we haven't been able to have a copy of it. Right. Yeah. Right. Look at. It. So I think that was my next step for me to take my notes. That first draft I did, um, make it better, talk with Joe, and then us all get together in person where we have hard copies of it and talk through at least that part of the beach ordinance and feel confident that we're there. And then we can shift to this definition in the protective part of the dunes and the beach, um, that language. Okay. So if you guys are okay with that, that'll be um, a plan of action. And I'll just tell myself it's okay that we're not sponsoring food truck rodeos. <laughs> and oh, um, I do have a question. Some people have asked about the trash cans. Are they coming back onto the beach? Um, Joe's still on. Um, there's usually, we usually take them down during the winter, don't we, Joe? Uh, we have historically, um, we've talked about now that we have Robert on staff, maybe keeping them out, but uh, I haven't had a chance to have a conversation with him to see how frequently he'd be able to go out to service them. Do you think they should stay out, Martha? Well, I mean, I do understand that hurricane season, you know, is an issue, but after today, maybe we're getting out of that and, um, I mean, I know dog people appreciate them um, so that they can dispose of things, but um, certainly not. I wouldn't think they'd get as full as they do in the summer. You know, sometimes there's a problem with them overflowing um, in the summer. Mm -hmm. I don't know how often, who, who's, who empties them, has been emptying them before Robert. Was Be, beach, beach patrol always has, and our beach patrol season only goes from April 1st through September 30th. Right. So I'll make a note to um, bug Joe and ask him again about this so we can talk to Robert and, and see if there's, I think it would make sense to leave him out there if we can, but it's always been an issue of, do we have, someone to service them when it's not beach patrol. Yeah, yeah. And the only other thing I, I know, I think this got brought up to you, Jerry. Um, I checked the, the POA fire permit again today. And the only thing on location it has is 50 feet from a turtle nest or not in the dunes. It says nothing about being above the high tide. Um. They, they were going to add it, you know, when you apply for the permit yeah. and it'd be great if they did it there, but 
after they apply for the permit, you get the, your permit's been approved back. Right. And, and Heather was going to edit it and add that sentence that said your fire has to be above the high tide mark. Well, if it's yeah. yeah. So when they get an approval, they get that direction of. But, but I do think it needs to be in the application too, because that's where people read it. When they get the permit back, they're like, oh, great. I got the permit. And um, I don't let know me, why it would say one thing on the application and not be on the permit. Yeah. And I, I don't know if it was just a matter of what was easy to edit or not, but I do know that, you know, uh, Joe and I had a conversation with Heather and John Kinney about fires on the beach, and that jurisdictional thing and everything. And um, threw out lots of ideas and thoughts and, and John Kenny told me that there was an executive committee meeting today that they were talking about it. So we're, we're moving forward on at least making sure people know where to do, know what and where to do it. So I'm trying honestly <laughs> to um, clear up any confusion on this. So, you know, hopefully we can, like you said, if they can edit the approval, maybe they can add it to that application and all the online stuff that talks about it. So, right. I mean, they uh, they must change their website all the time. I, I wouldn't yeah. think, you know. Yeah, I'll, I'll ask um, Heather further about that. I will pursue that further. Definitely. Okay. Thank you. Anything else, you guys? I've got one quick question. The last time we talked about uh, the marsh management plan uh -huh. um, and certain people seem to have had copies of the Folly and Kiowa plans, uh, which is fine. I, I just don't know if they're available to us. They are available to you and I will find it. I'm looking here. It, it's in my email box. I'll forward it to you, to everybody on the committee. It's not like I want to steal, uh, what is it, Dr. Elko's work? Oh, no, it, it's probably it. somewhere too. I mean, Catherine sent it to me. It's on their website. Okay. The I, I worked on uh, the Follies website. This has been months and months and months ago and didn't okay. do anything about it. No, I I have it in a document attached to um, an email, and it's easier to find than and then going to the team's website. So I'll make sure everybody has a copy of it. Okay. And um, again, to um, tons of information in our beach management plan. If you know you just don't have a new book to start and want to dive into. It. Um, so anyway. I don't have anything else. If there are no other questions, a motion to adjourn would be fine. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor. Aye, aye, aye. aye. <laughs> okay, guys, stay dry. Thank you so much. And uh -huh. I'll get to work. So um, we'll have hard copies of stuff to talk about next time. And we will try to meet in person. Okay, great.